hey guys and welcome back to my channel i am back with another true crime video and today we are going to be doing the story of kelly nontlandla kumalo and senzo robert meiwa now if you're new to this channel i try and do these videos often so please do check out the playlist i've done a couple already and i will be doing more in the near future but before we dive into today's video i just have a few disclaimers first and foremost all the information that i'll be sharing with you guys today has been published in the media in one form or the other and this is just a compilation of everything that is happening if it's not from the media then the individuals in question have shared this information themselves either through interviews or through their families and therefore i'll not be casting any aspersions or making up any facts everything that i'll be saying here has been published before or has come from the horse's mouth more than anything else i'll also be incorporating what is currently happening in court lastly and definitely not least i have to stress that these are just still allegations because they are yet to be proven in a court of law so with all of that said and without wasting any more time let's dive into today's video today's video takes us to johannesburg south africa then we'll go to KwaZulu natal and subsequently we'll end up in johannesburg once more Kelly Nontlanza Kumalo was born on the 11th of November 1984 in Spreadview, Johannesburg to mother Ndombi Gladness Kumalo and although she knew who her father was, she has said in numerous interviews that he decided to be absent and therefore he didn't play any role in her upbringing. She has one sister, a little sister named Zandi Le Kumalo. Kelly started school in Spreadview but when she was in grade 1, formerly known as Sub A back in the day, her mother moved her and her sister to Ngotu in Natal because of all the riots that were happening at the time due to the apartheid regime. In KwaZulu-Natal, they joined their extended family and this is where Kelly got rooted when it comes to her culture. Once things started coming down, the family then moved back to Johannesburg. The girls enrolled back to school but Kelly wouldn't be at school for too long because in March of her 10th grade year, she decided to drop out and she would later state that she was just not happy, she felt like she wasn't able to cope and keep up with her grades and therefore she just decided to drop out. Immediately after dropping out, she would run away from home for six months. She said that she felt because her mother wasn't happy, she was left with no other choice but to run away for six months until she cools down. I actually went to grade 10 like briefly. By March, I was out of school. I wasn't happy. I wasn't keeping up and I'm like, I know I'm a smart child, but I'm just not happy. You know, when, you know when your heart and passion is no longer Into, there yeah. mm. and you're no longer happy and you're <clears throat> young at that time, you don't know what's wrong and you end up thinking maybe there's something wrong with you. Mm. But I was just not happy and I just disappeared. Mom hated me for it. Mm. And I remember her saying to me, you will never be anything. Mm. When she eventually went back home, she needed to have a plan. She needed some sort of a bottom line. Okay, you dropped out of school, but now what is the plan? Now, luckily, Kelly could sing. She knew she could sing. So when she saw an advert on SABC One looking for a singer, it was a gospel star search named Crux Gospel Star Search. She decided she was going to enter. And deep in her heart, she says that she knew she could win. She knew she could win because she knew she could sing. And all off to the auditions she went. When she got there, hundreds of people had come to the auditions. After all, Crack's Gospel Star Search was the biggest talent search show at the time. Kelly says she wasn't intimidated by the numbers. Instead, she felt like she was confident that she would win and two, they were just there looking for her specifically. She went through the auditions phase and then was chosen to go to the next round and then the next round and then the next round after that. She was good. She was really, really good. However, she was auditioning amongst other men Amazing singers. So unfortunately for her, she did not win, but she came up as a runner up. But if there's one thing that the whole experience actually showed was that Kelly had what it takes. She had proven not only to herself, but to thousands of South Africans who were watching that she was good and she was amazing at what she was doing. And this is where she was actually discovered by Bonsai Entertainment and they eventually signed her up to their recording company. Through this recording company, she went on to release her debut album, Grimise 
Mandela, which launched her career in the mainstream South African music industry. Kelly almost instantly made a name for herself and created a lot of hype around her name. And when rumors of her being a virgin started circulating, she decided to ignite the fire and ride that wave. And that is when she came up with a second studio album in September of 2006, and she named it EGG, following those rumors. Kelly's star was shining brighter than ever during this period, and within the first year of her career, she got two nominations at the South African Music Awards. The first one was for the Best Afropop Album, as well as a Song of the Year nomination, and this was in 2006. She was doing pretty well for herself. She has went on to mention that from as early as 20 years old, she was getting paid around 30,000 to 80,000 rands per gig and would do multiple gigs per night. So financially, she was doing pretty well for herself. Kelly's love life has been as colorful as her career. When she first got into the industry in 2005, she was dating Zimbabwean-born business mogul Prosper Mgwaiwa. Prosper and Kelly were together for three years and were seen as a power couple at the time. He even went on to propose to her on television on the show All You Need Is Love on SABC One in 2006. Unfortunately though, the engagement did not last long because the following year in 2007, the couple broke up. Prosper, who has since passed away, may his soul rest in peace, went on to marry someone else. And the following year, in 2008, Kelly also moved on and started a new relationship. Kelly went on to date Mole Mokatle Khomaluhanye, aka Jupe Jupe. At the time, Jupe Jupe was a recording artist, a presenter, as well as son of infamous businesswoman Mama Jackie. The two dated for many years, and Kelly expressed that in the beginning, the relationship was fun and amazing. But a lot of that changed when substances started being introduced into the mix. She has come out to say that she was introduced to substances for the first time in 2009 on Jupe Jupe's birthday when she took her first line of coke. She has mentioned that she felt pressured to do this. She felt like she had to do it as some sort of birthday gift to him. Nonetheless, she has stressed that in the first few years, she was happy and she was doing most of the things voluntarily. Some of the things that she did during this time is that she got a tattoo of Jup Jup on her shoulder to show her love. Yeah, unfortunately, things did go downhill though after the couple fell pregnant with their son, Christian. Jup Jup wasn't really able to adjust to the fact that Kelly was now pregnant and he continued with the fast lifestyle. And unfortunately, because Kelly wasn't able to go out to the streets, then he started cheating. As if this was not enough, he also started being pretty physical with Kelly and would constantly lay his hands on her. Kelly says that by the beginning of 2010, she was over the whole relationship and was planning to leave him. But unfortunately, before she could, tragedy would strike. Jup Jup and his friend Temba Chabalala took the lives of four learners and caused two more to be brain damaged for life. They were drag racing in Soweto and drove their cars into the school children when they were walking home from school. They would later be charged for taking their lives and attempting to take the lives of the surviving two. Because of the gravity of what was happening, Kelly decided to stay with Jup Jup and support him throughout the trial. She was constantly seen right beside her man in court, even though she would later state that he was still very nasty towards her in the background. But every time he had an appearance, Kelly Kumalo was there next to him, supporting him. On the 5th of December 2012, Jup Jup was finally found guilty and sentenced and was meant to go to jail for what was supposed to be a very long time. And this is when Kelly truly started getting her independence, would then slowly move on with her life. On the same year, she released an album called The Past, The Present and The Future. And this album would go on to win her the Best Female Artist of the Year Award at the Summers certifying that she was back at the top. The following year, in January of 2013, she met a young man named Senzo Meyewa. Back in KwaZulu-Natal, on the very same year Kelly Kumalo was born, Senzo Robert Meyewa was born on the 24th of January in 1984 in Umlazi in Durban. Now, I know and I understand that he's known or is said to have been born in 1987 in the soccer industry, but this is nothing new. A lot of soccer players actually change their year of birth to accommodate them in order for them to play in the professional football space for longer. So it is believed or it is alleged that this is what happened here, but he definitely wasn't born in 1987. He was born in 1984. So nonetheless, he was born on the 24th of January, 1984, with his twin brother, Siabonga Meiwa. He was born to 
to mother Irene Dombifuti Meiwa and father Samuel Meiwa. Him and his twin were middle kids. They had an older brother and younger siblings. Senzo grew up in a big family full of love, but his parents were pretty strict as well. They had a tuck shop and he was required to come back home from school and go work at the tuck shop and contribute towards the family business. Unfortunately, the family was struck by tragedy, and I think Senzo perhaps even more, when his twin brother, Siabonga, tragically passed away after drowning in the ocean. For his education, Senzo went to Guamgaga High School where he enjoyed playing soccer during, before, and even after school. Because he loved soccer so much, he later joined a local football team called Umlazi-based London Cosmos FC, where he was coached by Thomas Poswa. Unfortunately, though, his parents weren't so happy about this because all they wanted from him was for him to go to school, get an education and come back from school and work at the tuck shop. As a result of this, him and his coach, Poswa, would devise a plan that when it was his turn to work at the tuck shop and the team had enough money, they would buy all the stock at the tuck shop, giving him an excuse to close the tuck shop early and then ultimately giving him time to go practice with the rest of the team. And on days where they did not have the luxury of money to do this then his older brother Sifiso would cover up for him until he finished training. At the time Senzo was playing for the under 10s at London Cosmos FC as a striker and during one of their matches their goalkeeper didn't come and he jumped in and took over that position for the day and he did amazingly well. Coach Poso would later say that he saw almost immediately that day that Senzo would go on to make a very good goalkeeper. Senzo's coach, together with his principal at Guamamgaga. Side note, his principal was also a former Amazulu goalkeeper, Vumamfega. So the coach and the principal decided to team up and go to Senzo's parents and basically convince them. Let them know that, listen, your son has a big shot at making it big in the soccer industry. So loosen up a little bit and let's try and take this boy up. And when the coach saw an advert for trials for the Pirates Development Program happening in Mayfair Central Johannesburg, he scrapped up some money and took some of his best players, including Senzo Meiwa, by bus all the way from Durban to Johannesburg to try out. The coach says it took less than five minutes for the Pirates Development recruiters to realize that they wanted Senzo Meiwa. And therefore, Senzo was picked and enrolled on the program. He played for the Pirates Development side for five years. Thereafter, in 2005, he joined the first team. On the same year, in 2005, Senza met Mandi Samkize. Senza was 21 years old at the time, and Mandi Sa, who was born in 1986, was just 19 years old. Mandi Sa came from a well-to-do affluent family and was just starting her higher education and was doing very well for herself. And Senza, although he was only in the beginning stages of his professional football career, was also doing pretty well for himself. Things were looking great for the pair. They immediately fell in love and were constantly seen together everywhere they went. Their relationship would last for many years from this point onwards, growing from strength to strength year by year. They moved in together and not too long after, they welcomed their first child together and eventually they got married in a beautiful traditional ceremony. As beautiful as their relationship was, it was not all roses. Senzo was known to be a womanizer. Now, even though everyone knew that he was with Mandisa, but he had a number of women on the side, he went as far as making someone else pregnant before Mandisa fell pregnant with their first child. But regardless of this, Mandisa and Senzo went on to make their own baby and moved on to getting married. With everything that was happening in his private life, his professional career was flourishing. He was not just the goalkeeper of Pirates, but now he was also the captain of the team. And simultaneously, he would later become the captain of the national soccer team by finding Bafana as well. So life was pretty good. In January of 2013, Senzo was watching a repeat broadcasting of the Feather Awards on ACBC One when he saw Kelly Kumalo on TV. When he saw her, he wanted her almost immediately. He expressed this to his friends and said to them, nah man, this will just be a hit and run, nothing serious, a one night stand type of situation, then I'll go back to my marriage. Luckily for him, one of his friends knew someone who was friends with someone that knew Kelly Kelly pretty well. So that's how then they were hooked up. He started pursuing Kelly and eventually Kelly agreed. Kelly would later state in multiple interviews that she had no idea who he was prior to meeting him for the very first time. And furthermore, Senzo had neglected to tell Kelly that he was married. 
These two went on to have what I can only describe as a whirlwind romance. Instead of Senzo driving around town with his wife like he used to, he was now driving around in the same car, but Kelly was the passenger princess this time around. And Kelly would slowly but surely start sharing these pictures on social media. Slowly things started falling apart though. Within three months of Senzo and Kelly starting to date, Kelly had fallen pregnant. Mandisa had also caught wind about the relationship and she went on to try and confront Kelly Kumalo. And this is when the ladies ended up having an altercation that would later lead to court. Mandita had followed Kelly's car on the highway in a bid to try and confront her. Kelly claims that Mandisa tried to run her off the road. The ladies then stopped and this is when they then had an altercation. Uh, Kelly says that this is actually the first time when she found out that her baby daddy, her boyfriend, was actually married to someone else so they had that whole altercation the sisters then kelly and zandi are alleged to have hit her uh, which is what led to the court case even with his wife finding out about his affair senzo did not leave kelly instead he left his marital home and moved in with kelly senzo's friends say that initially kelly and senzo had decided to terminate the baby kelly has also collaborated this in a couple of interviews but something happened when kelly was driving to the clinic to do this and and this made Senzo believe that nope, this is not supposed to happen. They're not supposed to do this. Perhaps this is his twin brother letting him know that he is sending him a son. Now you must remember at this point he already has two children. Okay, he has the first child with a side chick and then has a second child with Mandisa. And both those children are girls. So he really believed that maybe, just maybe, his twin brother is sending him a son. So they decided against the termination. A few months later, Kelly would give birth to Senzo's third daughter, Baby Tingo. As much as Senzo was still with Kelly, he was still with his wife too. Baby Tingo was born in March of 2014 and on the 3rd of April 2014, just a month later, Senzo and his wife were seen on the cover of Drum magazine. They were basically telling the country that one, they were back together, Senzo was apologizing, Man Lisa was also explaining the journey of forgiveness. And this is exactly six months before Senzo's untimely passing. The couple would be seen in many more similar magazine covers in the months moving forward. They were slowly but surely trying to mend their marriage, but on the same breath, Senzo had a one month old child he still needed to be part of the baby's life and he still needed to continuously visit kelly to try and see the baby and because of this he was up and down between kelly and the baby as well as mandisa and as a result of this it made it very difficult for the relationship between him and kelly to truly die down before we continue with today's video can you kindly give a few seconds to today's sponsor today's video is sponsored by car track car track is not just an advanced vehicle tracking company but also offers enhanced security features so on top of tracking your car 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 days a year they also offer you the option of added protection features they have an amazing added feature called car protector where they're able to give you tow assistance accident assistance as well as medical assistance so if you're in the middle of a road trip and your car needs some sort of mechanical assistance and you need your car to be towed somewhere you can rest assured that car track will have your back and will get you aid as soon as possible same thing applies if you are in an accident they will get you accident assistance as well as medical assistance and to get all these amazing features you just have to activate protector on your car tracker Secure, protect, and also get the peace of mind today by visiting get.cartrack.co.za forward slash the hyphen plug. I'm going to make sure to leave the link in the description box as well as pinned in the comments. So thank you so much to Cartrack for sponsoring today's video. And without wasting any more time, let's dive back into today's video. On the 26th of October 2014, just seven months after Kelly had given birth to their daughter, Senzo was with Kelly. Kelly's sister Zandi, Longway who was dating Zandi at the time, and two of Senzo's friends, Mtoko as well as Dumelo. They were all coming from Kelly's gig and thereafter the plan was that everyone was going to go to Kelly's house for Sunday lunch where Kelly's mom was cooking. Senzo also had other plans for that evening. 
He would be meeting his friends, Pirates players, Mandisa and her friends at a bra in Santon. So while he was with Kelly and everyone else, he'd continuously call the boys back in Santon to find out what everyone was doing. And they would say, everyone is there, they're just chilling, they're having a bra, Mandisa is already there with her friends. So what Sinzo basically said to one of his friends was that, no, it's fine, he'll come around. He's just going to go drop off Kelly at her house and kiss the baby and then come to them. But like I already said, by the time they got to Kelly's house, Kelly's mom was cooking and then they just sat. Uh, they watched a game of Manchester that was playing and they had a few drinks. So it's important for me to make a note that from this point onwards, I will share with you first the version of the people that were in the house on that particular night. Firstly, let's recap. Who was at the house on that particular night? There were seven people there. One, there was Senzo Meiwa. Two, there was Kelly Kumalo. Three, there was Kelly Kumalo's sister, Zandi Kumalo. Four, there was Longwe Twala, who was dating Zandi at the time. Five, there was Mtoko Zisi, who is Senzo's friend, as well as Dumelo, who is also Senzo's friend. And the seventh person was Kelly's mother, Ndombi Gladness Kumalo. According to the six people remaining, intruders came into the house on the 26th of October 2014 at around 9 p.m. in the evening and they demanded cell phones from everyone. They then alleged that the first person who ran out of the house as soon as he saw the intruders was Longwe Twala. It is said that Longwe pushed one of the intruders in order to make his way out of the house as far as fast as he could. You know, I mean, it was a robbery gone wrong, you know. Um, I was even the coward of the day because I actually ran out as those uh, gunmen actually came in uh, uh, and requested phones and, and money from us. Uh, I was actually the first to stand up to try and protect everyone. Uh, I wanted to go uh, get help, but it was later. Uh, neighbors and everyone was sleeping. I didn't even have my phone because I left it at the house, so I couldn't call the cops. A, f a fight broke loose inside because obviously uh, Senza was protecting Kelly because the guys were man handling all Kelly, and then that's when... Uh, uh, the guys actually uh, uh, um, released the gunshot and then have you been interacting with the police or they called you um, yes mm. we've, we've been investigated by police uh, they took our phones uh, I went in for questioning and everything which phones uh, our, our, self, our personal cell phones oh okay. yes just, um, they, yeah. did, they hadn't taken them from you. They, they yeah they took them from us and then the, the criminals I mean no 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 no, no, okay. no. they couldn't take my phone because I ran out I had my phone in my pocket so they didn't take my phone mm -hmm. But it was later, neighbors and everyone was sleeping. I didn't even have my phone because I left it at the house, so I couldn't call the cops. The cops, the cops. They couldn't take my phone because I ran out. Ran I had my phone in my pocket, so they didn't take my phone. Take my phone. Take my phone. While Longwe ran away, the men in the house were requesting cell phones from everyone who was there. As much as they did get some cell phones, they didn't get everyone's cell phone because not everyone handed over their cell phone because they still had their cell phones the next day. Now, this includes Kelly Kumalo, who would still have her phone the following day, but would also allege that they took one of her other phones. Now, I have to stress that allegedly this is all they took. They only took the cell phones and only the cell phones that were handed to them. So any other phone that they couldn't see or was in someone's pocket they didn't take now the problem or rather the weird thing about this is that Senza's bmw was parked outside so obviously the kids would have been in the house they did not request those there were tvs in the house they didn't take them they literally had the opportunity to take as much as they could but all they took with these cell phones now in the process of trying to take their cell phones a situation arose where now Senza had to protect kelly because this is what they're saying in a bid to try and protect kelly then Senzo was shot and his life was taken. Now he was shot at twice. He was the only person who was shot at. After this, the men then ran and went out. Now my problem is that if these men are trigger happy, why wouldn't the first person who ran out of the house, who could have easily went to call the police, easily used his own cell phone to call the police outside, or possibly was probably going outside to get his own firearm to come back and defend the team. Why wouldn't they then make sure that long way doesn't go out. Why would they just let Longwe go? They don't even know where Longwe is going. For all they knew, Longwe was going to call the police. Longwe was going to go fetch his own firearm. Why would they just easily let someone run out of the house who already saw that they were coming to rob? I think that's the first issue with this version of the story. And then the second one is the fact that Longwe just contradicted himself. First, he said he didn't have his cell phone with him outside, which is why he ultimately did not call the police. And then second of all, he said his, his phone was in the pocket. So many discrepancies. So basically what the six remaining people who were in the house are saying was that this was just the house burglary gone wrong. 
After this, Kelly and her sister then rushed Senzo Meiwa to hospital. He was unfortunately though pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. His friends who were at the Santon Bry all rushed down to the hospital to be by his side. This also included Mandisa and her own support team. To say everyone was heartbroken and devastated is an understatement. It is then alleged that while everyone was in hospital, Back at Kelly's house, the house was being cleaned. By the time the police came, they said that there was water on the floor and as a result, the place was spotless. It was clean and not a single shell casing was ever found at the scene. When Kelly and her sister eventually left the hospital in the early hours of the morning, they went back to Fort Loris and on arrival, instead of directly going to their house, they decided to go to a traditional healer. Now, this traditional healer would be performing a cleansing ritual on them. Now, upon my own investigation i found out that one these cleansing rituals are normally done by people who have themselves committed a crime but they can also be done by someone who has witnessed a crime or someone who has had someone pass away next to them on top of them or anything like that is it common for people in their situations to do it the very same night or day when this thing happened not really but I'm definitely not an expert in this. Actually, I know nothing about this. So if you know anything regarding these rituals, when they're done, who does them, what happens, please do comment down below. I'll pin your comments and just educate us in terms of how these type of rituals work. So after the alleged cleansing, then the sisters went back home. By the time the sun came up the following morning, almost the whole of South Africa already knew what had happened the previous night. The police, journalists, and the entire community was basically surrounded in Kelly's house requesting for answers and just wanting to know what really happened inside that house. Unfortunately, all six of the people that were in the house were not really saying much. A few days later, Senzo's family laid Senzo to rest at Moses Mabidi Stadium in a provincial state funeral with thousands of people in attendance. Kelly was not at the funeral because at this point, everyone wanted to find out what had happened. They wanted answers from them and they felt like she wasn't given the answers and therefore they started blaming her. Senzo's immediate family recognized and supported Mandisa, the wife, throughout the whole grieving process and they did not mince their words when it came to them expressing just how much they did not like, respect, nor recognize Kelly at all. Kelly also did the same on her end, going as far as keeping all of Senzo's belongings, including his cars, which she would still be driving around. Senzo's friends eventually went to her after a couple of weeks to beg her to return Senzo's clothes as well as his items and cars back to his family. After the funeral, the beginning of a long, tedious battle to try and figure out what happened at that house that night would start. This would take years and years. Years passed with no real leads in this case. Senza passed away in 2014. 2015, there was nothing. 2016, there was nothing. 2017, there was nothing. And this is nothing, not without the family trying. The family was constantly trying to reach out to people and trying to find out what was happening, trying to keep Senzo's Mayua's name in the news. The father was constantly doing interviews, constantly asking people what happened, constantly reminding people about uh, what happened to his son and unfortunately during all of that in 2018 he was hit by a stroke he got a bedridden from 2018 until his passing in 2019. now his family says that as much as he got a stroke but the main reason he got that stroke was from the stress he basically passed away from stress a stroke but more than anything else a broken heart from just trying to figure out what happened to his son. Weirdly enough, the year after he passed away, that is when the case started gaining momentum. This is actually when we found out that there are actually two teams of police investigating this case. Now, the first team is led by Joyce Mutelezi. Now, according to the team that is led by Joyce, they believe that one, there were never any intruders to begin with and that someone in the house actually took Senzo Mayo's life and that someone might have been Longwe. They believe that some sort of argument went down between Longwe and Senzo, which ended up with Senzo's life been taken from him. 
which then would explain why Longboy's story was just not making sense and he kept making mistakes as to whether he had his phone or he didn't have his phone because he was making that whole scenario up. I think with this theory then becomes tricky is why wouldn't the other people in the house just tell the truth? For instance, Senzo's two friends were there. Those friends did not know Longwe, so why would they then cover up for him? So that's where it becomes very tricky because those two friends stand firm that there were intruders in the house. Also, I must stress and also just state that Senzo's family believe that this is what actually happened. So they believe in this theory and they believe that there was never any intruders. One of the people actually pulled the trigger in the house. And let's go to the second theory. And spoiler alert, this is a theory that is currently being tested in court. Now, according to the second set of investigators led by Brigadier Bongani, they actually agree with the whole notion of intruders. But according to them, these weren't just ordinary intruders. These were hired hitmen. And these hitmen were hired by Kelly Kumalo to take Senzo's life and only just Senzo's life. And hence... Once they took Senzo's life, they were out of the house. So they're definitely not surprised that everyone else in the house may have indeed felt like they are being robbed and may have indeed felt like these are actual intruders out to get us because they didn't know of the bigger plan, but they believe Kelly knew the plan. The question then becomes, what do they know that supports their theory? And there are actually four or five main things that actually support this theory that they're currently testing. So just to lay it out there, there are five men that were hired for the purposes of this video we're just going to call them accused number one accused two three four and five so two of these men moses sibia as well as bongani mdasi they are accused one and two. They went to the police in 2020 and they wrote down confessions. Now, as much as years later, they have gone back to say that, no, they were coerced. They were forced into these confessions. However, in 2020, they wrote down these confessions. They implicated Kelly Kumalo themselves as well as their friends in the Senzo Meiwe murder. In a nutshell, basically, the confession is that Kelly hired them, paid them 100,000 rands and gave them an instruction to take Senzo Meiwe's life. I'll try my best to insert a clip of the actual confession that is being read out in court. So Kelly is linked to accused one and two through their confession. Now the next way that Kelly is linked is through cell phone records. Cell phone records link Kelly Kumalo to these men dating back from as early as the 2nd of August of 2014, two months prior to Senzo's Meliwe's passing. Kelly was on a call on her phone with accused number five on the 2nd of August, two months prior, and the call lasted almost two minutes. Then there was another call to the same accused number five from Kelly on the 15th of October, just nine days before Senzo passed away. Now this call was about 98 seconds, which is about a minute and a half. Another piece of evidence that supports this theory and implicates Kelly is an image in her photo gallery of her phone. Now there's a picture of money that is in a clear bag that is in Kelly Kumalo's phone. The same picture can be found in the camera roll of accused number three. So she is now linked to four of the accused. I choose number one and two via confession. I choose number three via this picture of money that is in a clear bag that is in both their phones and also accused number five because she was calling him. So she is linked to these men according to this theory and according to what is currently happening in court. So I have to just mention in passing that Senza Mayo's family do not believe in this particular theory, but nonetheless, this is what is currently being tested in court. I was expecting the court to release these five suspects because they are not involved. Not even one of them is involved. Mm. The, the police are just lying. They are making us, uh, I don't want to use a bad word. Yeah. But they think, yeah, because we are, there's evidence, there's another docket that has evidence. But by I think there's a lot of tokens. Mm. By us, by us, mm. by, by us, I mean, I won't pay. by us. Yeah, yeah. There's evidence. Even even the ministry has let him 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 let him
Now, someone would probably ask us what has been taking so long. What has been taking so long is the fact that the judge had to try and determine first whether the confessions would be admissible in the main case. Now, because they had retracted their statements, then there had to be a trial within a trial to test if those confessions, even though these men are retracting them, will they be carried over to the main case? And the judgment has been yes, they are going to be carried over to the next case. And because of that yes, chances are Kelly might then get arrested. If these men lose their case and get arrested for Senzio Mayer's case, you can definitely expect that Kelly Kumalo would be indicted next. I think that's where we should end it for today when it comes to this case. This is probably one of the most frustrating cases I've ever done. I did not want to do this case. You guys forced me to do this case. So I had to do it for you. And honestly, I don't know where I stand personally when it comes to it. Depending on what time you ask me, literally, I could easily tell you, oh no, I believe the first theory. I believe the second theory. Or I don't even believe any of these theories. I literally don't know. So I'm very interested to find out from you guys what do you guys think happened here do you think the, the npa is onto something do you think they have the right people do you believe in the five accused and kelly kumalo theory do you believe in the long way theory and i know there are those other people that actually believe that this whole thing is wrong go get mandy samkize and charge her for taking her husband's life so let me know in the comments down below what you guys believe and i'll see you guys in the next one and please stay safe out there and more than anything else please don't forget to click on the link below in the comment section as well as in the description box and visit car track and sign up and get yourself that tracker thank you so much for watching i'll see you guys on the next one bye